So the next item on our agenda is the overview presentation of the proposed 2022 City County Council or City County uh, Annual Budget Overview presentation. King Clark, uh, City Controller, will now present this um, uh, brief overview of the 2022 proposed budget. Uh, please note that this is uh, purely for information purposes and there will be no question or answer session as comments and questions can be asked on specific areas of the budget during the various upcoming committee meetings. Uh, Mr. Clark, would you come forward, please? Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, especially to see you all in person today and uh, in, in presenting to you uh, the 2022 budget introduction uh, and our proposal from the mayor's office. I have been working uh, with my staff, who I want to thank um, for the last two months, uh, pulling together proposals, working with all of the agencies and departments to come up with a proposal for you to take under consideration through this process over the next 10 weeks. And in doing so, have tried our best to take into account what is a unique time in the city's history as we recover from the pandemic, but also is uh, a challenging time as it relates to our, our revenues. And so I'll go into detail, uh, a little more detail in this presentation, and then obviously through committee hearings, you'll hear the detail of all of the budgets uh, through this process. Uh, as the mayor said, let's get to work. I'll we'll go to the next slide. Um, the 2022 budget uh, really looks at our, our, our proposal looks at how we've done over the last four years specifically in generating balanced budgets, but also takes into account our approach to balanced budgets and to revenue as a whole over these last few years. Specifically, we continue to preserve fund balances, specifically have grown those balances where possible over these last four years, uh, five years, and have been working towards making sure and protecting our credit rating as well. Those credit ratings are what allow us to do bond issues and to do large projects on behalf of our citizens here at the city. And so it's a critical piece of the equation that we're constantly thinking about. We also have found ways to make strategic investments in the city, county, uh, enterprise, and in our neighborhoods wherever we can, as we always do. For the 2022 proposed budget strategy, similar, very strategic investments, a little less than we've been able to do in prior years. Um, the operational budget, which is the majority of what I'm talking about tonight, uh, is slim. There, aren't, there isn't huge growth. There is some growth in revenue, but it is not as substantial as we've seen in prior years. The pandemic unemployment numbers are catching up for 2022, so it's something we have to keep in mind in putting together an operational budget. Um, but we, we, conser we continue with very conservative estimates around revenue and, um, and are anticipating a steady economic growth over time. So while this 2022 budget is a challenge, we know it will, as the recovery continues, it will continue to improve over the subsequent operating budgets. And of course, as with all of the mayor's budget proposals, there are no tax increases in this budget proposal at all. The next slide, please. There are two slides here to explain the past five years specifically and why we are in the position we are, the strong fiscal position that we are as we enter the pandemic and as we're coming out and looking towards economic recovery. In this first slide, you see underspend year over year. We have underspend in our budget every year. So the proposed budgets that this body has approved, each agency and department goes about and tries to operationalize everything that they've laid out to you. And oftentimes there is some underspend, either because hiring isn't at the anticipated levels, there are contracts that can't get signed in time, whatever may happen, plans change. That happens within a budget. This underspend over these last few years has been a pretty historic number. When you look at that underspend, it means that fund balances are growing. And I'll show that more in our presentation here shortly, but it's continued to grow over this period of time. On the next slide, you see our collections are also above our estimates. So our revenue collections have been consistently above what are conservative estimates in revenue. That has been a part of the controller's office for many years and has been continued in this administration to ensure that we do not dig deep into reserves in putting together our budgets and that we have balanced budgets. And so this continued uh, collections that are above our estimates actually allows us again growing fund balances even further than just the underspend does. On the next slide, you see the result. We have passed by this body a couple of policies, an unassigned fund balance policy and an unrestricted fund balance policy. 
These two policies say that we need to hold in certain funds a certain amount of a percent of our total annual budget to protect our credit rating and to protect our citizens in case something unexpected came up. We were incredibly lucky over the last 24 months that the federal government has chosen to actually pass legislation that provided money directly to local governments to let us respond. But you can't always count on that. And so the city continues to hold fund balances and has been careful in how we've approached our fund balances and spending in those because we aren't ever sure, certain what may come. And with such strong economic times, we made the best of it. Truly, I think that we've actually grown the fund balances to make it a point where we are able to do things like we've done with Circle City Forward, historic investments out of our coffers that allow us to actually do good work in our neighborhoods and in our city for our citizens. Specifically, I'll point you to 2020. Oh, sorry. Uh, 2020, um, specifically, immediately upon uh, the beginning of the pandemic in March of last year, we put reserves in place with every agency and department, we froze hiring, and started restricting spending as quickly as we could. No, not knowing what the federal government may do, and not knowing whether or not there was going to be aid coming from state or federal government, we knew we needed to protect the city's finances so that we didn't have to reduce services or lay off any staff. And we were able to do that incredibly effectively. At this time, uh, at this time last year, unemployment was in double digits in Marion County. And so not knowing what would happen and how fast the recovery would come, we held on fund balance until we saw a real recovery coming, which of course we have. Um, the recovery has been uh, moving along uh, uh, throughout the last year. So the result of all this is uh, improvements in credit ratings across the board. We've been able to improve credit ratings for the city and county um, across the board. And in each presentation that we've been able to have, there's some highlights there for you uh, to lay out some of the things the rating agencies have said specifically about our financial management. That is absolutely in conjunction with this fiscal body. It would not happen if we weren't all looking at this together and passing balanced budgets. The result of that is these improved credit ratings, allowing us to get what are now historic lows in bond issuances uh, in terms of rates. Um, and, and so that will allow us to continue to do that. On the next slide, it's impossible to talk about all about this without talking about the actual stimulus funding that's come to the city. The largest of which, of course, last year, $168 million in the Coronavirus Relief Fund passed in the spring of last year. A secondary CARES Act II passed at the end of last year, providing directly emergency rental assistance to us and modifying some of the rules around the CARES Act funding that we did receive. And now, subsequently, earlier this year, passing and the signing of the American Rescue Plan Act, the result of that being $419 million directly allocated to Indianapolis and Marion County. And let me be clear, that is Indianapolis and Marion County. There were direct allocations also to all four excluded cities and towns in the city, as well as the state having its own allocation. Uh, the amount of dollars allocated in, and that's only the fiscal recovery fund. We also have the emergency rental assistance, round two, and the high needs allocation. And there's a number of other programs in the American Rescue Plan that we will continue to bring before this body to continue to uh, seek out that federal funding we see it as our job, and I, I'm sure the council does as well, to bring as much federal money back to Indianapolis and Marion County residents as we can. In this situation, that is absolutely our goal. Talking a little bit more about the economic recovery, this lays out for you how the recovery has gone just from an unemployment rate perspective. Unemployment alone is not the full story of the economic recovery. Even with unemployment at the rates it's at, we know there's a fair number of people we all know and of our citizens who were able to continue to work from home and didn't necessarily have an impact in their income. Some of those, some of those residents may have been paying higher income taxes than others. Others, some essential workers, also continue to work at rates that were lower than I think a lot of us would prefer. And that has changed. We're now in a worker's economy and everyone can feel that. As this recovery moves on, you're seeing that pressure on wages. So that changes the equation for us as an employer, but it also keeps us in mind as we look at this recovery, what do we do to promote good jobs in this kind of economy? We want to build this economy stronger in Marion County than it was before the pandemic. That took many years during the last recession. When you think back to 2008 and 2009, the people who lost their jobs, some of them were the last to get into the recovery. Very focused, as you look at the American Rescue Plan Act, you'll see we're very focused on trying to bring people up and to move up. Because just unemployment and numbers alone do not tell the full story. Uh, underemployed 
um, citizens in our, in our city and county are a critical piece of this equation. And they pay directly income tax and property tax. That's a part of the equation for us to be able to provide our services. So there's a, uh, I won't go over each of these individually, but there's a number of things that we did, obviously, in the recovery and focused on the recovery that I wanted to make sure were in your hands. I won't go into depth on that. So let's jump into the actual introduced budget. So all of that lays out the background of how we looked at and went into this new budget year. We do have a balanced budget proposal that we've submitted to the council. Our budget ordinance is balanced. And our uh, growth was relatively minimal, but there is some growth that we've programmed specifically out. I will not, in these next few slides, be discussing what is in the American, Recover or the American Rescue Plan proposal. That's a separate proposal. This is the operational budget. And this is a critical piece to think through as we present this budget and talk about it together over the next 10 weeks. One-time funding sources should not be operationalized in the budget. It will only look like we're just cutting budgets in future years when those revenues go away. We have to live within our means for our standard services. That is the budget we're proposing. Separately, you will have fiscal packages, and I'll talk about that in the last slide, that lay out the other pieces of the package we believe we can put in terms of one-time funding sources. And I know those questions will come up through this process, and I welcome them. I believe strong fiscal management for us and that protection of that credit rating is an operational-based budget that does not include federal funding at the level it is. It would make no sense for us to try to program that now and then cut budgets in two or three years. It's just not a place any of us want to be, nor does it set the right path for our citizens and taxpayers. Let's jump into the breakdown, and I'll go over these briefly. We'll obviously be talking these in depth. Um, property tax and income tax have always made up the majority of our, our revenue. Income tax has been a growing portion of that revenue over the last few years. You'll all be aware we also oftentimes, because of our relationship and the way it works with the Department of Revenue, have supplemental income tax distributions that often come to us in the spring. We do not program those supplemental distributions. We don't count on them when we put together the operational budget. The state can make determinations on how they actually lock in our revenue estimates for income tax. And because they dictate that, we never take a more aggressive approach on that. And we haven't in the, in the mayor's administration. Intergovernmental um, funding coming from federal, federal uh, resources and grants, state grants, all those items also make up a large portion of our budget. And then charges for services and others here in a smaller, smaller capacity. In the next slide, it breaks down a little further and so you can see really the size and scale of what income tax and property tax mean here in the city county government. Specifically, because of what we're dealing with with income tax and the recovery, it's critical to look at this, specifically the 2021 estimated. This 2021 estimated number, specifically the income tax number at 405 million, is not what we budgeted at. During the pandemic last year, we made the decision to budget at a flat line 378 million in income tax because we knew there was a big hit coming and we did not want to take any chances that we would not be able to recover. Again, we could not count on federal dollars. We, did not, we had to make sure that we took care of the taxpayers here locally without that expectation that any more stimulus may come. And so holding at 378 million, you can see our 2022 introduced goes to 372. It was a shrink in income tax based on what we budgeted, but we're lucky. If we would have grown it fully to the 405, we would have had a cut to 372. You can imagine that would have been a really difficult budget season for all of us to go through, cutting budgets across the board, which is what would have been required of us. Luckily, property tax has been strong. Uh, this housing market has, is incredible, obviously, and we all know that. But you can see we've continued to see growth, uh, specifically in property taxes, which has helped us move along and be able to actually program. So overall, when you see the 2021 estimated at 850 uh, million in collections, and then the 832 that we're having in the 2022 budget, um, really looking from that 811 to 832, you can see there's money to program. It's not a lot, but we actually, I feel like, made the right budget move to not take that income tax growth at the time we did, and instead to put that in reserves and be prepared in case we didn't have additional revenue. On the, onto the appropriation side, um, as is pretty typical, the public safety initiatives and criminal justice services make up the majority of the budget. Um, in addition, other public services are executive, legislative, and administrative services, and debt service and pension, um, which are requirements within our budget that we always take out of the top of the line. And then the breakdown by county agency. 
Um, seeing a little bit of a shrink here uh, in the sheriff's size, specifically, uh, as the mayor mentioned, the uh, removal of a private jail contractor, but also another proposal we'll talk a little bit about is the new uh, Metropolitan Emergency Services Agency and the agreement in partnership with the sheriff to have 911 dispatch move into that new county um, first responding agency. Uh, reduce some budget there. The Superior Court at 16%, always the two largest in the county side, and then the breakdown um, from there. I won't go into great detail. The one thing I will note is that that MESA is the new Metropolitan Emergency Services Agency, um, which I'll talk a little bit more later in the presentation. And on the city department side, um, the big three, as typical, uh, IMPD making up the largest portion, IFD and the Department of War Public Works pretty closely behind, um, DMD, which of course is a huge part of what you see in those intergovernmental transfers earlier in our presentation on revenue, um, Parks and Rec at 4%, uh, Business and Neighborhood Services at 3%. So now I'm going to jump into the operational budget investments we were able to make. You'll hear about a lot of these in your committee presentations as each of the individual agencies and departments comes before committee. But I wanted to highlight some on the top of the line here so you have some awareness of what we're going into. On the law enforcement investment side, we're funding 22 new civilian public safety officers, reaching 40 total, uh, to focus specifically on non-emergency situations. These are non-armed public safety officers, civilian side, who will actually be going out and doing um, work that helps support law enforcement, but is not specifically law enforcement required, requires a law enforcement officer. An expansion of the body-worn camera program continues. We've continued to add additional cameras where it made sense. Uh, we've added uh, cameras to our detectives to allow them to utilize those cameras when they're off-duty. We did not want a situation in which an off-duty officer was not have, did not have a body cam, so that's included. And the expansion of the data analytics program at IMPD. This was a one-time fiscal this body saw at the last full council meeting and approved to add a chief data officer, data analyst, as well as some data analysis tools requested by IMPD. And now we'll be moving towards opera operationalizing those. We will include that in the standard budget for 2022. On the criminal justice investment side, again, as the mayor said, for the first time in 25 years, there is no private jail operator in Marion County, uh, first time since 1996. Uh, Seven million in guardium ad litem within the Marion Superior Court. Guardium ad litem, for those who don't know, are um, advocates who work on behalf of minors in the court system to protect their interests. This has never been a fully funded contract, and for 2022 it is for the first time. Continued investment in the transition to the new community justice campus. As that campus opens um, with the adult detention center opening late in December of this year and the courts beginning operations in January of next year, there will be additional costs associated with that as we go through the process uh, to make sure we're giving ourselves some room for the unknown. We have some budgeted line items to make sure that we can help support them to make sure that it operates flawlessly when it opens. Increased funding for additional staff supplies and pathology for the coroner's office. I think it's not news to anybody, especially those on public safety committee, that the coroner's office has continued to need more resources. We've been focused on that. Circle City Forward, of course, is building them a new facility, a new $16 million facility that is badly needed. If you have not visited the coroner's facility, I, I encourage you to do so and to understand uh, what they're working with and what they need. But also, we're making investments specifically in capital for them now, things that they need for their own safety of their staff but also just increase in workload has resulted in an increase in their, con in, in their overall budget. Their budget uh, amongst the county, I think, is the largest single increase outside of the election board, which is now having an election on, after an off year of about 32% increase. And an investment in a case management system for the prosecutor's office. They've requested a case management system of their own um, to be built specifically for their work. Marion County is, obviously has the largest caseload in the state, and so they're looking for something more tailor-built and specific for them. Um, on the next slide, we go into investments specifically in the root causes of crime. We're excited to have an expansion of the reentry program. Three staff members, specifically city county staff members who will be housed at the new adult detention facility, helping those inmates as they come out with reentry. The expansion of the Assessment and Inter Intervention Center, working with this council, we have built the Assessment and Inter Intervention Center, opened the center, grown it now uh, through a fiscal you passed to 24-7 operations, and in 2022, we will expand it to 60 beds by the end of next year. 
all of those being at a 24-7 operation. Expansion of the food policy and community nutrition program by two employees and maintaining our $500,000 in annual funding for the Indy Food Fund as well. Within government services, I won't go into each of these individually, but these are, uh, if, thank you. If the, these are expansions on um, staffing specifically within the city and county departments and agencies. DPW seeing some expansion around the engineering staff, as well as a new levy and channels group, something we don't have today, but allow us to do real maintenance on, on levies and channels that hasn't been able to be done at any uh, wide capacity today. Uh, completion of the DPW second shift. Many of you remember approving the second shift as we talked about that with DPW a need for additional road maintenance work and operations work. Because of uh, the pandemic last year, we paused the expansion, full expansion of that group. We are funding fully the expansion of that group. So we have a full second shift. Um, we did pay increases for our park staff, which we are funding. And then uh, creation of the Consolidated Emergency Services Agency. So this is the Metropolitan Emergency Services Agency. A lot of you have been around long enough to see different iterations and versions of this. Um, the Emergency Management Agency prior to the Ballard administration as well as uh, what was called MECA, the Metropolitan Emergency Communications Agency existed. We're taking all pieces of first responder specific work, those who support first responders, and bringing that together into one county agency to manage it. So 911 dispatch um, from the sheriff's office will be moving over and we'll be working through compensation to adjust compensation so we can fairly pay those staff, but also to be able to recruit. This is a really challenging time to recruit in those jobs um, and we've continued to struggle with that. This is an intent to add more budget and to be able to grow that and make it a focus. Um, the Indianapolis Fire Department has also agreed to take their dispatch uh, telecommunicators and move them into this organization for the first time, bringing our dispatch together uh, in many years. It also brings out of the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department the Division of Homeland Security, what we would consider our emergency management and planning entity in the county. We'll be moving into this organization and out of IMPD. So as opposed to being in a law enforcement entity, being in a first responding entity, a little bit broader scope and reach that way. And then also we will be including what is called public safety communications, the radio communications support uh, mechanism within the county and really in the metropolitan area, they support outside of the county as well. That entire group will be moving out of the Office of Public Health and Safety and moving into the county agency, emergency services agency. You'll be hearing that at the public safety committee. Um, also some expansion for BNS and permit staff, which has been a challenging uh, area for BNS. Additional personnel and community investments in DMD. We have five new FTEs in DMD and a big expansion for them growing their, their staff. And some expansion for parks programming staff. On the capital equipment side, substantial investments. Um, we we've, are maintaining our 290 patrol vehicles. We made a six year plan that lays out 290 new police vehicles each year. Uh, working with IMPD, we've got that plan fully funded and funded again for next year. $1 million for IFD apparatus, $250,000 increase for parks for capital needs. Many of you remember a few years ago, we added a million dollars to the parks budget specifically to address capital needs. We are growing that and excited to do so. Uh, 1.25 million for solid waste trucks, an increase in funding for DMD to allow them to do property acquisition for economic development initiatives. 4 million uh, additional dollars for the DPW capital improvement program or plan. Uh, and 1.5 million for additional salt and traffic supplies. And then we are gonna do an implementation of a centralized vehicle purchasing pilot. This is kind of nerdy in my game, but trying to move forward with figuring out how we replace the fleet in an effective way for our municipal vehicles. It's been a challenge. IFD's done a great job of addressing it with apparatus. I think IMPD now has a plan in place for the rest of our municipal vehicles specifically, and DPW's made incredible progress, specifically on their fleet, um, which we're really proud of. But for the rest of the municipal fleet, we're trying to find a way to make it actually happen on an annual basis and be operationalized. Other infrastructure investments, and these are the last few slides here, uh, 163 million for roads resurfacing bridges, sidewalks, and trails, 107 million for stormwater, and then, um, of course, the Circle City Forward Initiative, the bond issue that you will be hearing through the budget process this year is funded in this budget for next year with the levy shift that we discussed uh, earlier in the year. And so that levy shift allowed us to include that levy in the budget ordinance and now that will generate the funding that allows us to fund these new projects in Circle City Forward. Of, of course, especially excited about the 25 plus million in parks projects 
Um, excited to see a corner facility, excited to see a solid waste garage get replaced. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to see some of those, I encourage all of you counselors to see <laughs> the state of affairs and see the great improvement we'll be able to make. And then these last two, I won't go into great detail, but we have laid out the 2022 Transportation Capital Plan as well as the Stormwater Plan. Those will be covered in detail in the Public Works Committee later this week by Director Parker. Um, we're really excited about what American Rescue Plan is allowing us to operationalize in that as well as the additional $25 million in greenways um, that we're introducing as a fiscal. And our last slide um, is the 2022 proposals for council consideration. So, I talked a lot about the operational budget. This is all operational budget focused, but the package as a whole includes a number of pieces. There's no way to talk through this budget without talking about the American Rescue Plan and its impact overall. And if you could, thank you. Uh, but also you will be hearing Circle City Forward Phase 1 bonds, which we talked about. Um, we, you will be hearing phase three fiscal. So you've already done phase two, the $25 million in residential streets. That was a spend down out of fund balance. We felt comfortable with our fund balance, um, with our fund balances where they are. This additional $25 million in this phase three fiscal is specifically for greenways and trails. And the reason we're comfortable with that again, as you saw that fund balance projections earlier, we are in an incredibly strong position to be making investments. I believe strongly that this is a time for government to be making investments in our community and showing the strength in the recovery and actually constructing and building as a way to do that. And so we believe this is a great opportunity uh, and we hope the council will support it. We've talked about state rental assistance partnership the mayor mentioned, um, the uh, nearly 100 million that is available to us through the state um, emergency uh, rental assistance program that they have allowed us to partner with them on uh, and we'll, you will be hearing tonight. And the creation of the Metropolitan Emergency Services Agency will be its own ordinance proposal that will come before uh, Public Safety Committee. Another item, which is a smaller item that is in this, is also the consolidation of the Telecom and Video Services Agency into the Information Services Agency. More and more, Channel 16 and its work over time will continue to be digital focused and less and less cable. Um, focused. And so as that happens, it makes sense to bring it into IT to make it a truly part of our technology infrastructure and to support it. Uh, TVSA obviously is a very small agency. It's hard to get growth in their budget. Putting in an ISA gives them more resources they wouldn't have available to them. And of course, as the former CIO, I may be a little biased, but I am excited what it'll do for them. Uh, and then the last one, um, for recruiting and retention, which is an incredible challenge you will hear from every agency and department as you go through this process. You will hear the difficult in staffing, difficulty in staffing their agencies and departments. This economy has changed things significantly. And so there are pieces of this. Uh, I'll talk a little bit in my presentation for uh, the Office of Finance and Management tomorrow night about our salary and compensation study and the result of that to build a true living wage. Uh, Madam Leader worked on this years ago to move that number up. It's now time to review that again and move it up even further as a minimum wage within the county. So we're going to discuss that as a part of our as a, as a part of our presentation tomorrow. But in addition, adding things like uh, parental leave um, that the city doesn't currently provide, looking at our retirement options to make it a more attractive place to work. These are items we need to really think through, and so we are bringing through an ordinance to discuss with the council to try to make us more competitive in the market, uh, which is becoming a, a larger and larger problem for a number of our agencies' departments, and I know you will hear a lot about it. Uh, I want to thank you all. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to go through this process with you. I'm really excited. Um, there's nothing like talking about public finance to clear a room, uh, but <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> and I'm excited about what we have. This is an opportunity unlike any other for all of us to go through this. And for our citizens, it is so critical that we all engage together and make sure that we really do something that matters. This economic recovery has to be the best in Marion County that it isn't anywhere in the, in the country, and that's our goal. And so I hope you all work with us as we go through this process together to really make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Clark, and we look forward to working closely with you uh, as well in the coming months.